Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap up the lecture on marine ecology here. So we've talked about general principles of marine ecology, different ways that organisms interact within the marine ecosystems, you know, competition and symbiosis, population growth, things like that. And in the last lecture, we were talking about energy flow. That is an essential thing to, to understand when we talk about any ecosystems. And you know, within the marine ecosystem, we really want to understand how energy flows through the system. Definitely keep in mind the 10% rule. 10% of the energy goes up to the next level of the food chain, or we could call it the trophic pyramid. Both terms mean the same thing. And when we're looking at different ecosystems within the marine world, which ones actually have the largest producer base, the largest primary productivity. And that is, by and large, the reefs. Reefs, huge, huge producer base because of the corals and the zoanthellae and all of the algae associated with that ecosystem. Again, open ocean, not a whole lot out there. They're considered deserts because they have so little energy available. Uh, the continental shelf, more, but not nearly as much as what we see in the reef systems. Okay, so as we talk about energy, we want to look at three cycles associated with the marine ecosystem, three nutrient cycles. So the first one here is the carbon cycle. All right, so carbon, in generally in the form of carbon dioxide, is an important element associated with the marine ecosystem. And what we're going to see here, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere diffuses into the marine ecosystem. It also diffuses out. But when it enters into the water, now we get this dissolved carbon dioxide. And that gets picked up through the process or the pathway of photosynthesis. Okay, so that gets pulled in by the primary producers in the marine ecosystem, your algaes, and the, what little plants we have in the marine ecosystem. So then that carbon dioxide gets incorporated into their bodies, built into the cells and the tissues and the new organisms and etc. at the producer base. The producers then get eaten, so we talked about herbivory, so they're eaten by primary consumers, usually little animals. The zooplankton could be members of protista. Then those get eaten by the small fish, which are eaten by the bigger fish and the biggest fish, and so on up the food chain. So that carbon is transferred on up. Now, some of the carbon, carbon dioxide, comes out through respiration as the organism, animals exhale. And that goes back into dissolved carbon dioxide in the water, which then can circle back to the producers. Other carbon will come out of those animals when they die, through death or when they go to the bathroom, excretion. That gets picked up by decomposers, and that can get put back into the dissolved state in the water through decomposition. And then it just continues through the circle. Some of it will diffuse out of the environment, out of the aquatic system, back into the atmosphere. But the carbon is used by those producers to manufacture sugars or organic molecules. The carbon dioxide then, again, it goes into an animal, gets released back, and this should be in balance if everything was left alone. But things are changing. And we'll talk more about that in later chapters and later conversations about how, as the ocean is acidifying and carbon levels are changing, what is this doing to the entire ocean ecosystem? Okay, so carbon is one of the elements that we want to look at and one of the cycles that we want to play, pay a little bit of attention to. The second element is nitrogen. And then we also want to look at the third one, phosphorus. So nitrogen and phosphorus are really important for photosynthesis and primary production. All right, so to produce energy at the producer level, nitrogen and phosphorus are really important. So the thing we'll see with nitrogen and phosphorus is that they are often 
considered limiting factors. So for a lot of producers, this is a big limiting factor. They don't have enough. They don't have the right levels, so their populations are somewhat held in check. Now you remember we talked about population growth earlier. We said when limiting factors are removed, populations grow exponentially. So if a limited amount of nitrogen and phosphorus controls producer populations, primarily algaes. So let me let me start lining this up for you guys here. Okay, so here we go. Limited nitrogen and phosphorus equal low producer populations. So then when we have high nitrogen and phosphorus, this equals high producer populations. All right, so there's an event called eutrophication. We'll explore in later lectures that when you get this big influx of nitrogen and phosphorus into the system, producer populations grow and can grow rapidly. Sometimes that's a good thing, but when they do rapid growth or this real fast explosive growth, not in the good category at all. Definitely a big, big problem. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the cycle just so you guys get a general idea of what these cycles look like, the pictures of them, and how things are moving through them. All right, so here's nitrogen. The primary way nitrogen normally goes into the aquatic system is through dissolved nitrogen coming in in the form of nitrogen gas. Now we do see nitrates coming in. Nitrates come in naturally into the aquatic system. This is the bigger problem though. When we have influx of nitrogen or nitrates and ammonium from rivers, basically runoff. You know, that runoff. That's the big problem here. We get this runoff from terrestrial systems, and you get this big flood of nitrates and ammonia coming in, which now over or imbalance the system. So that stuff comes in, floods the system. There are bacteria and different organisms that will process the nitrogen. They have to do what we call fixing it. There's different, again, different bacteria, some archaea. That nitrogen becomes fixed, and then that gets absorbed and picked up by the producers. And we go back to that same circle. Producers get eaten by the consumers. Consumers do well. Boom, boom, boom. Everything looks good. And we just get this nice circle going. But when we have that big, big flood of nitrates into the system here because of massive amounts of runoff, then we get this big explosion of the primary producers and we have an imbalance in the system. The big problem generally occurs when you have this large death rate of your producers because they die off then you increase your detritus, your dissolved oxygen matter, and you know, we start throwing things out of balance. Um, the other issue when we talk about influx of nitrates is when the primary producers explode, sometimes we get into these things called the red tides. So remember the red tide, we talked about it before, a couple chapters ago. Look at the organisms that are associated with it. The red tide is due to a large influx of nitrates and also phosphates causing the explosion of a certain population. I want you guys to go look up that population. Big hint there, huh? Okay, and then phosphates. Normally, again, phosphates come in through the atmosphere. Atmospheric phosphates come in, get dissolved, get absorbed, herbivory consumers, circle through our food chain, etc. But back to the same problem. When we have runoff, rivers carrying this stuff in, now we have this extra amount of phosphates, explosion of primary producers, and we're back to our red tide issue again. All right, so the 
key with all of this, with all of these nutrients, is oh, sorry, wrong, wrong button there. The key with all of these nutrients is the nutrients need to be in balance. That's it. It's nothing crazy. It's nothing unbelievably complex. The nutrient levels just need to be in balance. That's the big thing, guys. You know, everything needs to be in balance in order for systems to work correctly. When those systems get out of balance, let's put it over here. When they get out of balance, that's when things get screwed up. So what we want to try to do is figure out how we can individually make sure we do our part to not contribute to things getting screwed up, take personal responsibility for it, do what we can. All right? So we're good. That is the beginning of marine ecology. So the next chapter we're going to get into, we're going to talk specifically about coral reefs. So that chapter is going to be a really cool one where we talk about the reefs, different types of reef, how reefs form, and I'll show you some pictures of the reefs we're going to be seeing when we're on our field course and get into the actual nitty-gritty details of coral reefs.